Gracious Father, as we come before your word, we pray that your spirit will inspire us. May these words will be hidden in our hearts and manifest in actions so that your glory will be spread throughout this country. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Today is the Trinitarian Sunday. But as you noticed, I have not started with the very common Trinitarian hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. I purposely change it to a very communal hymn. The very reason is a question that asked in last week. Last week after the service, we went to visit one of my aunts. And uh, at that house, there was a discussion. A discussion about the importance of this Sunday, which we name Pentecost. And they were talking about all those things and then I realized the greatest impact of the Pentecost is not the giving of the law as Jewish people believe. The Pentecost is named as uh, Zakan uh, Matat Toranu. Toranu means the time the law, the law is given or they call it Shevot, the, the festival of booths ending of that and offering of the first fruits. And some of the evangelical, some of the Pentecostal people think it is the day that God has given the tons, uh, glossolalia. It's not that. And some people believe the church is founded at the Pentecost. We have seen Jesus has spoken about the church before the Pentecost. So it is not that. Some may think the pouring of the Holy Spirit if you look at uh, John chapter, I think 20 or 22, Jesus breathed and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So it is not the pouring of the Holy Spirit either. But the importance of the Pentecost is the birthing of a new age, new situation, new community. When they were accused that they were drunkard and they were babbling, because they were uh, influenced by alcohol or wine. Look at what Peter says. Peter says um, in verse 15, Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only ninth hour in the morning. No one that is what was spoke, um, no, uh, no this, what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So he says, this is what spoken through prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel, Joel's prophecy. In the last days, it will be God's declared that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams even upon myself, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portions in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. Now here we see two times Peter is mentioning a new beginning, new days starting, integrating a new time new epoch. So here we see the beginning birthing of a new age and that new age restoration of Israel that is the community of God that is the church. Please listen to Merciful Wolf who wrote about the Trinity and the community of God. Because the Christian God is not a lonely God but rather a communion of three persons, 
Faith leads human beings into the divine communion. One cannot, however, have a self enclosed private deity. Communion with God is act one, once also communion with those others who have entrusted and themselves in faith to the same God. Hence, one and the same act of faith place a person into a new relationship both with God and with all others who stands in communion with God. So dear friends, when we remember the Trinity on Sunday, we have to remember that we have been brought together to a communion like in the Trinity and community of God. Let me remind you this truth in, in Jesus' um, high priestly prayer. John chapter 17, verses 20 onwards. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who with, will believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So dear friends, the community of God's people, the church is a very essential manifestation of triune God's communion within the Trinity. So I just want to focus on the impact of the Pentecost. The impact of the Pentecost is the restoration of Israel, the restoration of the people of God as a word called Ecclesia, that is the church. We are the birthing of the direct impact of the Pentecost. The new age has begun and this is the community of God. This is the new Israel which God is calling us to be um, infused together. As what we have heard, you remember, verse 42 says, They devote themselves to apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. This is a very essential verse because this characterizes the nature of the church or the main characteristics of the church. One can say it is the four pillars which the whole church is founded. Number one, the teaching of the apostles. You see, we have come to an age where there are numerous teachings going for and to and fro. And we have been sometimes shaken by things we hear. Some have the, 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 the dareness to say gospel according to da da da. And someone says, this is the word of God as God has given to me. So no one has the monopoly of truth of God. The truth of God doesn't own by a person. No one cannot say, I have inspired by Holy Spirit and I have the teaching, the sole teaching. No one else has the teaching. No one says has the revelation. You see here, there is an adjective. It is not just a didache, but didache ton apostolos, that is apostolon, that is Apostle, apostles teaching 
The adjective is very important. It is not what we are preaching and teaching. It is not my own interpretation of the text. It has to be the apostolic interpretation of the text. That tradition has been handed over generation after generation. And we are the sole legacy of that teaching. And we stand for that teaching. The teaching of the apostles. The church founded through that. So no one has the monopoly or no one has the whole right, exclusive right of God's word. God's word is handed over faithfully throughout generations. And we believe we are a Nicene Christian community. If we are not belong to that Nicene confession, we are not a church. The Nicene or apostolic confession summers up the main teaching of the apostles. So it is very important that we have to stand in the apostolic faith. Because you remember the Nicene Creed defined the church one apostolic, catholic, holy church. So the church is defined as apostolic church. It is the church which is um, universal, Catholic, and it is the church, it is set apart for God's purposes, holy church. So we have to remember the teaching of the apostles. That is the important thing. The word of God is the important thing that we should cherish. Not anyone's, any person's teaching or the way of which we are interpreting. We have to remember our interpretation has to be based on the apostolic interpretation. Not the interpretation of the Jews, not the interpretation of any other rabbi, the interpretation of the apostles. Jesus has entrusted the word of God to the apostles and the apostles have faithfully handed over that faith to us up to this day. Second is the fellowship, the koinonia. This is a very important word. You see, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 9 says, you have fellowship with the Son. And 2 Corinthians 13, 13 it says, you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This fellowship with God is manifest in us fellowship each other. That is what the Merzavel Wolf says. You know, he's talking about the community which magnify the unity, the brotherhood of each other. It is a close-knit community, closely-knit community, share in their life, sharing the way in which we have to live. Communion shows the Trinity. Our communion with each other, becoming one, is very important. You see, the whole idea of church has been distorted. One of my very uh, dear relative told me, he went to a church and he was awesome struck by the chairs, awesome struck by the air condition, awesome struck with the, the, the length and the, and the capacity of that sanctuary. Awesome struck with the stage. Awesome struck with the worship team. And he said, it is like a church in Korea. You see, church is not based on a building. It is not on a, on a, on a pews, on a, on a lights or whatever. Church is based on its people. That is you, my dear brothers and sisters. Based on you. You see, we have lost that communion. We have lost that fellowship. You know, sometimes we don't love each other. Today the church is what? A place where you come and you receive blessing and you get whatever, you give something and say hi and bye and go. Nothing about a communion living. Nothing about partnership in faith. Nothing about fellowship with each other. The koinonia is a very powerful word. The fellowship is a very powerful word. That word denotes loving community. 
Look what Jesus tells us. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 31. When he has gone out, this is the Judas Iscariot, Jesus said to them, said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, uh, glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to you, said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the commandment that Jesus has given. This is the commandment which, where which the whole community of church has built. But unfortunately, dust has lost. We come for a transactional reasons. We come and do things and we go. Nothing about having fellowship, nothing about loving each other, nothing about caring each other. You see these one another phrases, there are about 59 one another phrases in the, in the New Testament. Every one another phrase talk about caring, looking after someone else. I would like to thank my wife, you know sometimes she will uh, make my heart guilty and ask me, have you visited that person? As you go on to see this person, yesterday night, yesterday evening also she reminds me. You know sometimes we are lost in our work, lost in our business and we forget, easily forget one another. This community God has brought together is for a purpose, to love each other, to take care of each other, to have a very close, knit relationship, fellowship with each other. So dear church, let us start to live that community. I just want to urge you, let us change that whole system. Let us live together as a community of God, showing that we are disciples of Christ. This is very important in times like this. Look at John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. Let me read for you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 onwards. We declare you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. So the, so the teaching of apostles make us the fellowship. So it's important, the first teaching of apostles connected to fellowship. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. So when we have the fellowship, we have joy. Now look the other, look at the other two passages. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in, in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not and do, uh, do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, he, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Here, clearly mention the teaching of apostles and living a life according to the word of God will trickle down to fellowship, close fellowship. And when we have fellowship, what happens? We will have, you know, disagreements, you know, we will have uh, certain uh, hurts 
At that time, Apostle John reminds us, there is blood of Christ is available to wash us. So as a community, yes, we have to be a community, community which will have inevitably problems, clashes, but there we have blood of Christ to wash us and become again, have a true fellowship with each other. So dear church, I want to urge you to have the love, love one another. Let us have genuine love. Let us care for each other genuinely, not by our own lips. Look at the third component. It says, to breaking of bread. The breaking of bread, that is a sacrament. Breaking of bread reminds us the cross. So we are called to be a community, the cross-centered community living as a sacramental community, the community which is, which is infused by the sacrament. Why we share the bread of, why we share the breaking of bread? Why do we have communion every month? The simple reason is we have been bringing back again and again to the cross. So we ought to live as a community which is centered to cross cross-centered life, a sacramental living. Those days you have to remember it is a love feast, actually it is having fellowship. Now later we can see that, that true fellowship emerge through eating and drinking together, having a meal, common meal together. So it is not just having a wafer and a, and a, and a grape juice. Or a wine, but it is a more close knit community, community in which loving each other, sharing their life, having partnership with other. God has put us together as a church for that very purpose. So, dear church, I want to challenge you to live a sacramental life, life centered around the cross, cross centered life we see prayer. The community has to be marked by prayer. Now here if you look at this passage, it doesn't talk about worship, it doesn't, doesn't talk about youth fellowship, it doesn't talk about small groups, it doesn't talk about anything else, but talk, talks about prayer. Prayer is something which brings all together. We come together, why? To have true fellowship to learn the scriptures, to have sacramental life, cross-centered life. And not only that, we are called to be a community which will pray together. And our whole journey of life is a journey of prayer. Journey which make us a community which always pray. That is why we sometimes say, Please remember these people in our prayer. And that is why in every service we have an a intercessory prayer or a prayer of faithful. Because we as a community get together and pray. So prayer is an essential part. Not the choir, not the music, not the lights, not the stage, not the pews, not the beauty of the church, the sanctuary, but it's a community which is infused in prayer, praying together and living a life together, having partnership with each other in faith. When you have that kind of a community, we can see the results, outpouring of that. And I can give you seven things coming out from that. Look at the following verses. Here we says, Oh, came upon them, everyone. Because, so there is a fear of God. There will people become, sense the fear of God. You know what we lack in the present church? People don't fear the Lord. The fear of God, the reverence has diminished, has completely disappeared from the church. So when we live a community, 
where we stand with the apostolic teaching, when we have a very true fellowship with each other, when we live a sacramental life, and when we have a community of prayer, then the fear of God comes. You see, the next here you can look at, it says, because wonders and signs were made, uh, were made being done by the apostles. The miraculous witness, not just witness, but when you say something and when you go and pray, what happens? Miracles happen, wonders happen, the circumstances change. Not a prophet, not an apostle, not a pastor, not an evangelist can perform miracles. But everybody in the church, God will use in wondrous acts. Testify them, testify his words through miracles. Dear friends, second is wonders will start, miracles will start. The witness will be so strong that our witness will be manifested with God's surety of God's hand. And look at the third one, it says, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Here you can see the other one. That is the selflessness. It is not about a community of communist community. It is not about something that you have to share or you have to give everything. And we have a common purse and we will live like a common thing. Yes, when you look at the context, the Jerusalem, there were so many pilgrims and a lot of people are coming to faith and the church has to look after them and they were happy to look after. That is a certain situation there. But out of that situation, we can see the selflessness in that Christian community. We are very selfish. We are very self-centered. We think only on our things and only our, our work and our, our life. And we don't think outside of our box. So here, when we live in an apostolic teaching and when we live in fellowship and when we live in sacramental life and when we live in prayer you see what happened you become selfless you will open your heart i told my singular community once you know when you come to church pray when you bring something to the offertory pray and think how can i be a blessing to someone else and i ask them to pray and come so when, when God gives you someone in your heart, go and talk to him. If you, are, if you are compelled to give something, give that to that person. And that will show you are a true Christian community. Because you really care for each other. So dear friends, let us be selfless Christians. Let us think about others. Not receiving, but giving. Let us share our life openly not grabbing yourself but giving opening our hearts like this community which shares having selflessness as a value of church selflessness a third thing selflessness the fourth you can see here day by day they spent much time together in the temple and broken bro broke bread at homes and eat their food with glad and generous hearts. Here we see sharing life, sharing their homes. You see, sometimes my wife gets very angry when I say, let us have a meal. Uh, because we don't use, we are not used to that. You know, go somewhere and having a meal. But true Christianity is having meals. Look at how many times there are meals. Coming and looking at each other, having and having that sweet fellowship with each other visiting each other, looking after them, just sitting and have a discussion. You see, I remember this sweet, I have this, uh, this, this nostalgic idea when we, were, when we were small. The church people come to our house, then have a tea or some biscuits. And they were just talking and having all those discussions. 
always Christianity to me, I was a Buddhist those days, always Christianity is that, coming and having a fellowship with each other. Sharing life together, having meal together, you know, having life shared together. So it is very important, sharing life. And look at that, joy. We see joy here. We see they are glad. They have gladness. Joy manifest in this church. And look at 47, it says, and generous hearts, hearts are generous. 47 says, praise God and having the goodwill of all people. And then you praise God, having goodwill. And people are, when people see us, they will say, this is a true disciple of Christ. Like Jesus said, love one another. By loving, they will know you are a true disciple. You are a disciple of me. When we love, when we have that close communion with each other, the whole environment will change. And people will have goodwill. And they will, they will have the, the favor for us. Sometimes our churches try to do all sorts of programs to attract people. They used to go evangelism. They do all these projects. They will do all these things. Mercy ministries, that and this and that. Try to bring people in. But look at here. The final verse says, And day by day the Lord added to the numbers those who were being saved. So by being a community of Christ, being the new community, people will be attracted to the gospel. People will be attracted to the church. Just imagine, as a church, we live like this. What will be our impact? Just imagine. People will come in through these doors. We want to be a part of this church. And Lord will add, not ourselves, or not Mira, or not anyone else of it. But the Lord himself will bring people to this community. So dear brothers and sisters, in this Trinity and Sunday, let us commit to live a true triune community like God, like that fellowship. Let us have a community that glorifies God.